we're human, right? What? I hear that there are aliens among us. Well, yeah. David Icke says that they're hiding in your lizard brain. <laughs> David Icke. We're starting off the episode with David should. Icke. First of all, hi. Welcome to Matt Men. I'm Matt. I am also Matt. And we're talking about David Icke, a man who every so often sounds kind of reasonable and then says the moon isn't real. And then the reptilian brain comes out, and then we go to No, 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 no. He doesn't talk about reptilian brain. He talks about reptilians. Oh, fair, like, yes. Straight up, they are... I don't know if he thinks they're aliens or they are a offshoot of a different, like a, a troodon evolved into people, but... We should definitely get him on the show. <laughs> I, Until that happens, wait, though... Wait, hold on, hold on. If we're talking about David Icke, if I mentioned on the show the time I, I, I almost met David Icke and was very sad I didn't... I believe this is the first time we talked about him, so no. Okay, so um, I was shooting a, a segment for our show uh, about uh, JFK, the 50th anniversary of his murder. I right? remember that, yes. Okay, so while I was shooting, I noticed that Alex Jones, and this is before like everybody knew who Alex Jones was. Mm-hmm. I knew who he was. Yeah, me, me too. So I noticed that Alex Jones was doing a live remote, and I went up to him and was like, I told the guys I was with, I was like, hey guys, I know we got to get back to work, but i got to go meet Alex of Jones because this guy's certainly. crazy. So I went up and I talked to Alex Jones. I was like, hey, man, your stuff's real fun. Thanks. And he goes, God bless your brother. Mm. And it, it was raining outside. And right after he said that, he took a bottle of water and emptied it on his head. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's odd. And then one of his people just shoved a placard in my face and handed it to me. And I, I still have it at work that says, like, CIA wanted for the murder of JFK. And uh, as I was looking at this thing very confused, he goes, we'll be right back. And coming up, we're talking with David Icke in person. I'm like, oh my God, David Icke's gonna be here. David Icke and Alex Jones. This is too much. We have to we we have to stay here. And they're like, guys, we, we have to we have to get back right now. Otherwise, these things aren't gonna make air. And unfortunately, I had to leave. Uh, and I didn't get to meet David Icke and say, When did you go crazy, David? Mm-hmm. About 1973. <laughs> right. So sorry. We do movies here. We talk about movies here at the show, don't and, we? And David I. <laughs> hey, look, I mean, we've had more than one conspiracy uh, segment on our show, and that's the way it goes. So Love thanks it. for listening to David Ike today. <laughs> have, Just you, kidding. have you ever listened to his stuff? Oh, I do. Oh, they're like sure. they're like three and a half hour long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. prefer Graham Hancock, but Graham Hancock is is sane. What about David Wilcox? Uh not a not a big fan of his. Yeah, he's he's a little Give me, a, give me a little Robert Anton West. Oh, That's what I'm there talking you go. about. That there guy knows is. some Egypt. Have you ever uh, listened to uh, Phil Schneider bef- well, before he died? Uh-uh, no. Before he was, you know, committed suicide to the back of the head. Oh, one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of those suicide with two bullet wounds to the head. Yeah, yeah and, and, he had, and he had missing digits on his hand, so he literally could not. Mm. Whatever. I don't want to say anymore and then, like, end up missing. I love my kids. All right, and the mics are off. <laughs> Oh my God, they killed us. But in the meantime, <laughs> we're going to talk about things and such as, and Bl- yada, yada, yada. Blade Runner, Harvey Weinstein, because that just happened this week. Not and by we just happened that. means he, he got caught this right. week. Right, it got yeah. exposed. Um, I've been watching a little show called Mindhunter from um, from the great mind that brought you Zodiac and, you know, other things, Seven as well, and whatever, David Fitchner. And, uh, and then Matt is going to get down to some uh, psychology as we figure out why Matt doesn't like female directors. No, no, that is no, yours. No, I did it. That I is yours. It. That segment. is not me. <laughs> God damn it, Matt. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. I have a question for you. Hit me. Have you seen anything lately that you really like and you really want to talk about? Maybe something that uh, kind of serialized and lives on Netflix and is uh, created by... Oh, I thought you were talking about pornography there for a minute. Um, oh, yes, if it was on Netflix, uh, then... Oh, I was. I was uh, oh, oh, let's sorry. talk about a little show by uh, my favorite, one of my favorite directors, David Finchner, and it is called Manhunter. Did you say Fitchner? Finchner. Fitcher. Finch. I, th- I think you're confusing uh, the actor. You, William Fisher. People, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> the Zodiac guy. Fine. From henceforth. Of all the movies. I love how every time guy. you mention David Fincher, like the, the first thing you go to is Zodiac. Well, I mean, first Not of Fight all. Not Fight Club. 
First of all, it's his best movie. Second of no, all, it has been talked about no, 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 a no, no, whole no, no, lot no, no, recently no, 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 because no, no. we're at an anniversary time of that. Fight so it's Club. also, well, Fight Club that's, is best. that's just not true. But Fight Club is by far his best. It's not. First of all, obviously it's not by far. That's crazy talk. That is crazy, literally crazy talk from a crazy person. Is it better than other ones? Fine, we can debate that, but ridiculously better than anything else that he's yeah, ever done? Yeah. You are bananas. But right no, now... No, no, no. It encapsulates a time and a feeling perfectly. It's Oh, it's great. So Zodiac is exactly what you just said. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, my God. But, if nothing else, <laughs> Zodiac is important for Manhunter because it was also yeah. about serial killers. Um, it is a the story based on a book on a, the true story of the evolution of the FBI profiling division and how they began to use uh, psychology to understand how criminals work. I can't tell you the main actor's name. Uh, he's a he's a nice fellow. Uh, I enjoy him all right. Uh, who I really like is his partner, which also I can't name, but he's been in a whole lot. He's that guy in a whole lot of things, but he is a fan. Yes, please look that up. Yeah, I'm going to look it up. He is so good. Like, he is just excellent in this. It, it's blown my mind. Okay, so it's a 10-part series mm-hmm. on the Netflix. Did he direct it? Uh, David... Uh, the Zodiac guy uh, directed the first two episodes, <laughs> and then executive produced along with Charlize Theron. Ooh, uh, there that she brought the project to him originally. Oh, uh, Holt um, McCallany. Yeah. yeah. See, everybody knows him by his name. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. He's he's phenomenal. That guy needs a raise because he's been he's so great. As oh, he was the mechanic in Fight Club. Doesn't have anything to do with anything, but that's beside the point. He was also in Monster Trucks. It's a little bit of a... Uh, well, I mean, it's certainly procedural in the sense that you get to meet different serial killers that they talked yeah. to and had interviews with. Um, but there's a long game in the show itself. It definitely, at least the first, I'd say, six episodes felt like a movie. Like, I, I had no problem watching it like a movie, mm-hmm. you know, back to back. Um, they changed the length of each episode, which is also something, not just in this film, but I think, you know, I kind of like to talk about that a little bit on how you can utilize these new, the Netflix or the Hulu or whatever. You don't have a specific time that you have to do something. Mm-hmm. So if you're telling a story and your first episode is 59 minutes and then your second episode is 45 and then your third one, you're just, there's a, just a piece of the story you want to talk about and you can just do a 30 minute episode. Right. And that works. And I really love. And you don't have to that. stop every, you know, nine minutes or seven minutes. Right. To, you know, have someone go, but this means mm-hmm. he was alive the whole time. And then people look at each other awkwardly for 30 dun, dun, dun. seconds while they, you know, fade to black and exactly. go to commercial. Yeah. yeah. God, it, it, it is fun being able to play on the on, on the networks like that. Um, so it um, it feels like Zodiac. Mm-hmm. Uh, the worlds are definitely dark and dingy. Obviously. But no Ruffalo. No Ruffalo. No, not a lot of big names. Not a lot of names that really at all. Uh, they went... I think the main guy is from a TV show. He was on uh, like yeah. a WV TV show or something. So I, I like what they did with that as well. Do you think that this is going to take off kind of the way House of Cards did? Because that was the last thing that he really did, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it can. Um, I think that there's the serial killers that we have in, in America. They're they're pretty fascinating fellows. And to, yeah. to watch how that the evolution of that kind of goes, it does go over a long time period, like not a whole lifetime or anything, but it does cover many, many years. But I definitely think there are things that they can, you know, expand off of to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of wish that, as much as I like the stuff he's making for TV, I kind of wish he would make more movies. Oh, well, that's fair enough. Uh, like yeah. I said, uh, you know, I definitely felt like early on, at least, it felt like a movie. Now, here's the only, my biggest problem with this project, Mindhunters, is that there was another project that he was also supposed to do with Netflix before he was supposed to do Mindhunters, and it was called Utopia. Utopia is this probably the best show of the last ten years. Uh, BBC maybe it's a British show, mm-hmm. right? And it's about um, everything really. You know, the, these people are trying to to uh, euthanize people because they don't want uh, certain people to to be able to to grow in the world. Eugenics and and, and eugenics and all that other kind of stuff. And it's really fascinating. So I'm a little sad that he didn't do that one instead of this one. But it seems like serial killers uh, might be a little he, more up his alley because he, he's he done it a lot. Nellos, yeah, yeah, for sure. And something like that almost seems uh, a little Black Mirror-ish. Yeah. You know? And the last time he did sci-fi was, what, Alien 3? Yeah, it's been a while. So, yeah, yeah it might not might have Might have left out. a bad taste in his mouth. This one did not. This one, um, I, I'm, I believe I'm nine episodes into the ten episode thing because I don't have the life. Give it give it a grade. And these are the things we do. Solid B+. Uh, uh, really enjoyable. 
the the main actor. I'm gonna I'm gonna bestow this on him, and I'm really sorry, buddy. Uh, but he ra- reminded me a little too much of Glenn Howerton from <laughs> It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> So there were moments when he's talking to serial killers or interacting with them and stuff, and that's all I could think. And I was like, that's Glenn, and that's that's there's supposed to be some funny stuff here. He's like, uh, I know how we can find this killer. It's called the Dennis system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I kept waiting for something like that to happen. Thank goodness it didn't, but it worked. All right, it's not as, as violent as I thought that it might be. It's there's, a thinker. It's definitely a thinker. There's not a lot of thriller in it either. Like Nobody's going to eventually get murdered or something like that. I mean, the poor but th- people yeah, that but, get I mean, murdered. Then again, this is the guy who made... Um, talking, uh, like you know, writing code and uh, uh, depositions. Sure, interesting. So, oh, you know what? The, the best thing it. I can compare it to is when they interview the Arthur Lee character, character from Zodiac. Okay, when he goes to that room, it's that kind of back and forth with with this person. So, I'd recommend it. Enjoy it. Watch well, you, it. Well, you know what this means? Yes, he was alive the whole mm-hmm. time. <laughs> We were seen together in public this week. We were. What do we go do? Um, well, the thing that I can talk about or the thing I, I shouldn't? Yeah, You know, it's up to you. It's really up to you. Well, okay. We so, started out with David Icke, so, I mean, we're already going to be arrested when we leave this building today. Yeah, that's true. Uh, no, we uh, we saw Blade Runner 2049. Yes, we did, indeed, on a fancy full curved screen at the UA Galaxy 9 <laughs> in beautiful Dallas, Texas. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty good. Pretty good. The more I think about it, the more I'm just kind of meh, and I feel out of step with everybody else because everyone I've all, all the reviews I've seen are like, "This is the greatest. You got to go see this. This is a masterpiece." And I'm well. First of all, nobody's listening to them because it fell off fifty four percent this last weekend. So. Well, that's because sci fi movies don't do well. Right. No one. Every time I say this to people, they're like, "Well, what about Star Wars? Like that's fantasy." Yes. The only time sci fi does well of it is if it's more of a horror film or. Something like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, which I would say is more comedy mm-hmm. with sci-fi in it. Um, but if you had a movie like Valerian and the World of a Thousand Planets right. or whatever, mm-hmm. you don't even remember that movie. <laughs> that came out this, this year. I didn't know this thing. I can tell the people straight off the top, I'm not the biggest sci-fi fan. For me, it goes 2001 A Space Odyssey and then every other science fiction film that's ever To be made. honest, that's how they all go, though. And, and Although I would put one movie above 2001, Metropolis. Metropolis, I think, might be the best sci-fi movie of all time. But, I mean, if that's if that's your top two, you're doing well. Yeah, and so I, I, I do watch many sci-fi films. Usually it's going to be in the theater because I like the visual, visceral experience of it. it. it it's my favorite genre, like and, without a doubt. And this had a lot of those good moments. Um, yeah, it did. We, um, we should go ahead and tell everybody. We're going to spoil it. We're going to spoil oh, it. Yeah, it's been out for a couple of weeks, so get over it. Three, two, one. Yeah. Okay. Everybody dies in the end. <laughs> well, almost. Yeah. Um, now, before we get into this, were you a fan of the original? Um, my description of the original <laughs> was it was very good, but not great. Mm-hmm. A little long, a little boring, looked really pretty. Um, yeah. Uh, and I did a knee jerk reaction on uh, the website. <laughs> about this and that's kind of how I saw the original like I love the original but it's mostly for the visuals more than anything else sure um, because that's kind of what it is um, there's nothing incredibly uh, I don't want to say interesting because I, I find parts of it interesting but there's nothing incredibly unique about the story itself sure right indeed um, the idea of what makes a human human you know uh, can replicants be human? Blah blah blah. Uh, ever since there have been robots. Sure. I mean, hell, you can even take that back to uh, um, Frankenstein, right? The modern Prometheus. Okay, so if someone says they don't like the original Blade Runner, I get it, but no one can say that it's not a pretty movie. It's a very pretty movie. This one felt like a lot of missed opportunities, and it felt like they had a lot of great ideas. And they just scratched the surface on them. And the story they decided to tell was not as interesting as the stories surrounding them. Were they planning on making a second Blade Runner <sighs> when they were shooting? No, 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 no. No. Are you sure about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm completely sure. Because it was based off of Philip K. Dick's uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. 
Oh, I know. No, no, no. I, yeah. I, I, no. Mm, mm, but I mean, I still feel like that when you no. shoot shoot at that level at that budget. No, no, because back then, um, that that still was in the time when. Uh, sequels... Oh, I'm talking about the new one. To, to be. Oh, I thought you were talking about the original. No, 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 I'm no. I'm just talking about this one. This one. Yes. Probably because yeah. everything does now. Exactly. So um, instead of telling a complete story, they left it open. Right. Because for some reason, 20 minutes before the movie ends, they introduced a subplot about all of the replicants getting ready to, you know, rise up and overcome. Or yes. It's like maybe 30 minutes before the end. And it never comes up again. It's literally one scene and it's never mentioned. And it, you could cut that scene out of the movie and it doesn't do anything. The only thing it does is it solidifies that he is not Deckard's kid. Right. Um. And my my biggest problem with that, like, okay, so the person making the memories, that's his kid. Kind of interesting. All right. But that completely negates um, Ryan Gosling's emotional journey. Everything he goes through, once he finds out that he is just a replicant with uh, a shelf life, mm -hmm. uh, a predetermined shelf life, he he ceases to grow. And he's right back to square one. Right. So why do I care? And he lost uh, his holographic girlfriend, who is by far the most interesting character in the movie and sh should have been about her. Fascinating. Just fascinating. That girl. Right. There was no mystery in this one, certainly. Not at all. There was several different versions of the original one. But if you want to just talk about the original the theatrical release of the original there was a lot of mystery behind that one. People, was he a replicant? Was he not a replicant? You know, all those kind of things that we <laughs> that we debated for a long time. This had none of that. Like, they laid it out completely for the audience right. without any mystery about it. I, I felt two hours ahead of the movie the whole time, and that was made it seem a lot longer. But then again, like I said earlier, I wish they would have focused on other things. Like, first of all, focus on Dave Bautista's character. He was interesting. Yeah. Right? Uh, focus on the kids. He walks into this hellish, you know, post-apocalyptic, you know, Thunderdome, and it, all of a sudden it's uh, all these kids, and how they get there? Yeah. And where do they go from here? Do they just live here until they die? Like, wh what happens? Uh, now nah, we're not going to talk about it. Like, why, why, why introduce something that could be that interesting? And you want to talk about what makes a person a person? Are these replicant kids? Are these just foster, like, like orphan kids? Mm-hmm. Because we know he was a replicant and he was there, or he wasn't. It was a, an implanted the memory, memory, right? So it's it just nothing in it seemed to gel for me. And as good looking as the movie was, it still didn't. I hate I hate saying this. It didn't live up to the original to me. I think the original had more atmosphere. Um, definitely felt a lot less clean. There were so many cool things they played with in the original. For example, yeah. the umbrella, which you could also right. play with in this one, but you chose not to mm -hmm. for whatever particular reason. I don't know why they did that. The rain was something that you could expand it on because the rain is very cool. I mean, they did the a cool little shots where it you know kind of melted the hand, right? The replica and that kind of stuff. But expand on that. Do that. Make it more of a visual kind of thing. I yeah. don't. I don't need to see Ryan Gosling in every scene. No. No. Um. The it just felt like it's not a bad movie. Not like, at all. Not it's at all. not. It's just I, I disappointed. Uh, I don't know if my hopes were too high or, um, and I I, I kind of call this the uh, um, the Christopher Nolan effect, mm -hmm. where people love Christopher Nolan and they're like, oh look, he does longer takes and he's shooting wide now. And although he didn't start off doing that, right? But once he started using IMAX, he's like, I'm going to do bigger takes, wider takes. Okay, great. And people are like, oh, this is brilliant. And it's like, no, that's how it used to be. Right. Have we come to so far? And, yeah, and has our bar been lowered so so much that something like Blade Runner 2049 is considered a masterpiece when, you know, it's not even as good as Minority Report? Minor Minority Report has a lot more to say. Right. And I think a lot more visually interesting. It, it did something different. And that movie's not even that old. That movie's what, uh, fourteen years old? Mm, yes, more yeah. Than that. So, uh, fifteen years old. So, my point is, uh, have things been lowered so far that we now think that something that is a solid B minus, B B minus, is now considered a brilliant masterwork? And I don't my know. The answer to that is yes. Yes, we have. That's disappointing. And uh, you know, there's a thousand reasons that it could be. 
Yeah. There's also a thousand reasons they could come back as well. And I think, well, I mean, I think we're starting to see uh, a knee jerk, uh, negative knee jerk reaction to the way films have been made for like the last 10, 12 years. Um, like with a shaky cam, everything close up. Uh, Cause we're seeing people our age who grew up in, on movies from the eighties making stuff. Right. And which I is grew what, up on movies from the seventies, but I hear you. Right. But I mean, that's why you have movies like it. I wasn't born in the seventies people. I just want to make that clear. Right. Seventies movies were better than eighties movies, but that's beside the point. Go seventies films were better than eighties films, but eighties movies in terms of like popcorn entertainment, no one touches them. They're the best. Um, but anyway, uh, that's why you have something like uh, it that came out this year. Yes. Looks beautiful. Nice wide shots for the most part. It's because, you know, the people making them were inspired by movies from the 80s and not necessarily uh, MTV kind of stuff, right? So, um, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some better movies. And again, it's not bad. If someone says they like it, I get it. I like parts of it. But Blade Runner 2049, I don't think is a masterpiece. And five years from now, if a bunch of, you know, film nerds are around, sitting around and like, hey, let's put on a movie. Let's watch Blade Runner. They're not going to reach for this. They're going to reach for the original. It was uh, very good, but not great. Yeah. It was a little long, a little boring. <laughs> and it looked pretty. That's basically how I felt about this one and that one. And that's okay. Um, it didn't change my life. And so I was sad because I always look for movies that change my life. Got a question for you. Yes. Who's the bad guy? The universe. There, there's no bad guy in this there's, movie. There's no, there's no real antagonist. There's no Rucker Hauer. Well, I mean, is, was Jared Leto supposed to be that? No. Because he's in two, he's in two <laughs> scenes. What was he supposed to be then? I don't know because he was in two scenes. Yeah. Two scenes. Super weird. And then, again... Try to murder two people in don't don't try to do this, guys. This is just an example. Mm-hmm. Okay, in the movie, uh uh Jared Leto's replicant soldier, right? Um, she murders two people in the LAPD headquarters and doesn't get caught in twenty forty nine. You couldn't do that today. Is that a challenge? No, no, God no, no, no. no. How about if I do it in Vice City? No. No. I do it in Vice City. You got to do that sometimes. It's part of one of the missions. But you you see my point. Like, yes, I do. It completely unrealistic. Yes. Um, I know it's weird to say in a movie that has like flying cars. but And there wasn't a lot of future stuff that they put in there, too. No. no. And Back to the Future 2 didn't have a whole lot, but it still had more than that. Yeah. That is still so overrated for like a futuristic movie. Uh, no, it's not. It was a great film. It got more right than it. Futuristic. No, it got more right than it got wrong. I, I don't no, know. no, no. Think about it. 2015. Trust me. Ramp, I have no, about it. rampant 80s nostalgia. Nailed it. Uh, that hard on for uh, uh, Reagan and everything he stood for. Nailed it. I need more crazy, hoverboards. No, crazy inflation. Nailed it. We have hoverboards. And I needed more. Who does? The only thing those shoes. paying those for shoes. things with uh with your ID like just with a thumb and not not even a credit card. I was card. just talking about visuals. I need more cool science fiction. Visuals. But that that's what I think worked about that one is the fact that it's so grounded and so realistic. They even nailed some of the fashion. Well, they did. I but still wanted something more. You're an idiot. Come on, Zemeckis. <laughs> Sometimes stories are so big that even us should talk about them. Is is that a fat joke for Harvey Wein, uh, Weinstein? Uh, it is not, but that is Could what we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, the Harvey Weinstein situation. Man. It is, yeah. uh, uh, first of all, I think we all learned that nobody likes him because, man, everybody's throwing him under the bus after this. Well, no one ever has. Right? No, certainly. It's just he was in a position to where you had to pretend to. Um. Okay, here's the thing. Give it to me. When I haven't done this in a while, but when I was at USC, um, there were a, a few uh, tales told out of school. Right, sure. And one of them was, hey, if you're a good-looking twink, you know, Brian Singer will pick you up. Right. Right. Um, there, there are a lot of things that went around. I don't know if any of them are true. 
but I'm not going to say that I heard things about, well, I am. I, I heard things about Harvey Weinstein, and everyone kind of knew. Um, but here's the here's the thing that's kind of bothered me about this. Um, the fact that everyone has kept quiet is disturbing because that's the way it seems like it's always been. You don't have to look very hard to find uh, a sordid part of Hollywood's history. Like, it's just always been that way. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, going back to the silent era, there were uh, debaucherous tales yes. of, of things. Right? Okay. And murder. Right. Robert Wagner. Yes. <laughs> allegedly. Right? For sure. Um, so the fact that this has always happened and the fact that, you know, it's kind of, it, it, again, this isn't a defense. It's not. It's just, it seems like the people who want to use a position of power to get sex will go into the entertainment industry because it's easy to do that. If they just wanted to make money, there are plenty of businesses you can go into and just make money. Mm -hmm. But for them, it's not about money. It's about power and control. So while this might be ubiquitous throughout uh, rich people's society, it's more prevalent in film because of that? I don't think just film, um, but... It, yeah, I mean, there's a reason it's called the casting couch. You know, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it's not like anyone hasn't known about this. That's the sad thing. That uh, the fact that it's just now coming out and people are like, "Oh my god, can you believe that this is happening?" It's like, yeah, I mean, again, the phrase "casting couch" has been around forever. Sure. Uh, there was a joke when I was in school that people said, you know, actresses date directors. They'll sleep with producers, but they date directors, right? And it's kind of like, uh, why why do people become rock stars? Is it because they want to be the best musician? Well, if they just cared about playing music, they could probably be a session musician. Sure. They want to be a rock star for money and and sex, right? Because it's an, I don't want to say it's an easier way of getting it, but it's almost guaranteed when you're in that kind of position because. People feel like they have, that if they're pressured into it, they have to. Otherwise, their uh, career is going to be uh, negatively impacted. Sure. Right? Right. right. Um, so, again, the fact that this is just now becoming a thing, I think, is the most disturbing part of this. Because, really, everyone should have been talking about it forever. And the fact that it's just now taking, you know, just now women are coming out and saying things. I don't know if it was because... Uh, the Cosby allegations, you know, were kind of the watershed moment where it's like, oh, someone even that influential can be taken down. Yeah. But here's the crazy thing. While everyone's talking about Har Harvey Weinstein, to show you how far this spreads, have you ever heard of Screen Junkies? No. Screen Junkies is uh, one of the most subscribed to YouTube channels for film news. They're the ones that created the Honest Trailers. Okay. Well, guess what? Andy Signore, who created Screen Junkies, mm. just got fired for the exact same stuff that Harvey Weinstein was pulling. And he's no Harvey Weinstein. The Amazon guy. There's stories now that that guy might go. The guy down, Ain't It Cool, which that one, I don't know why. Oh, my God, no one, one's talking about that. <clears throat> that was the one that kind of hurt me deeply because it was like I've I've... I haven't known him personally, but you know, I've, I've been with them for a really long time. I supported them for a really yeah. long time. And he was Harry Knowles. Yeah. I mean, and, and that he was kind of made geek culture. Oh, cool absolutely. And accessible. Yes. Yes, completely. Um, but yeah. And again, these guys aren't the ones making big movies, but they're still in a position of moderate power. Sure. Yeah. And they're still doing that. So is this just a, a it's a male problem, I guess. I don't know. Is it a male problem only in the sense that we've always been the one in power, so we've only ha we've always been the one to be able to have that option? I, just because I've seen the movie Disclosure, I'm going to agree. Uh, but yeah, because I don't know, because I, I think that actually might be a big part of it. Yeah. Um, because then you also have that stigma of you know there are a lot of people who say oh men can't be raped because they always want it you know yeah and that well that's just not not true not true at all. Um, so I don't know. And then like Terry Crews even came out and said that he was. 
at a party last year. Yep. Last year with his wife. And a studio exec came up and just grabbed his junk. Like, no, I, I why would you do that to <laughs> Terry Crews? Yeah. <laughs> that, and that's, yeah, it's insane. It's such a small community that I can imagine the, the fear yeah. that somebody would live in if anything bad or negative happened, came back on them, and they're not as powerful, so they're just going to be... Oh, it doesn't take much to get blacklisted uh, yeah. at all. Yeah. Because, yeah, everybody works with everybody. Um, And again, if it's happening on screen junkies, screen junkies, <laughs> right. like, it's like 20 people or something, like, like some crazy number that came forward. And uh, one of them was the wife... Uh, or girlfriend of one of his co-hosts, and he said, "I'll fire him if you know you tell him." Like that—that's insane. Yeah, that's that's insane that this is all happening. We've had laws of the books for a really long time against that kind of stuff. Yeah, but yet it doesn't seem to have worked so well. I think what everyone's heard this week. Um, I I think this is the death nail in the cof- coffin. For Western patriarchy, honestly, I think that this is going to be the moment when, you know, women finally say, you know what, just stop. We're, we're, we've had enough. Yeah. You're not going to treat us this way anymore, and rightfully so. Um, sure. And I, it's just a shame that it's taken this long. And maybe now we can get rid of well, again the casting couch. You know that that was a term that was even used in our classes. Talking about, like, we had a Spielberg class, and they said, you know, and he's never used the casting couch. Like, we're like, just casually <laughs> talked about in, in in class. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, it's such a common phrase that there's porn about casting couches. So, like, there's a meme of just a black couch. And like, everybody you, knows. Right. Everybody knows. Right. So, it's like, why is it taking this long? And my wife actually seems to think, because uh, Harvey Weinstein said he's going to uh, Europe. He's going to move to Europe to get um, a treated for his sex addiction, which is bullshit, right? right? But she's thinking he's going to pull a Polanski. Sure. And because now that he's out of motion picture association, right, like he's just going to, he's going to go because someone's going to bring some kind of charges against him and he's going to go to a country where they're not going to extradite him. That's what she thinks. Wouldn't be surprised. Rich dudes do that. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it's not just the rich dudes, like you said. You know, it's at some random small little website company too. So, uh, you know, we gotta we gotta be nice to each other, nicer, be more respectful of each other. Now, learn and learn how to flirt. I mean, you know, come on, guys, do it right. Yeah. Completely Don't. kidding, guys. That was just a little joke there at the end. I love you all. Please do not hurt me. No, <laughs> no, no mean messages. But seriously, it's um, it's. Hopefully, hopefully we have changed. Hopefully, the you know putting these things out there will allow us the opportunity to evolve and change. When Ben Affleck says, "Oh, I can't believe this," and then somebody calls him out, he's right? then forced right. again to admit to himself and to everybody, "Hey, I I did bad things too, so I need to still work on myself." Yeah, it would just be nice if we could, you know, kind of uh, the way. Uh, oh God, what's his name? Um, director of RoboCop, uh, Paul Verhoeven. Yeah. The way he depicts his future, where everything is just kind of like gender neutral, and people can like shower next to each other without there being, you right. know, someone, you know, well, assaulting we're gonna stop, somebody. We're gonna have to stop selling sex then. I mean, that's the only way that's gonna happen. No, I, I, I just, I, I kind of wish we could get to the point where, you know, we could, you know, do our work, and not have it turn into well, like someone's gonna throw their weight around and try to try to get, you know, their D way. Like, let's just stop that. Let's just do our work. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, now that we're done talking about Harvey Weinstein, mm-hmm. let's uh, let's throw it into a uh, completely different gear. Let's let's take it to the fake world where everybody's yeah, safe right. out there in the fake world. Um. So, got a question? Yeah. Who is the most sexist character? In movies. Oh, man, this is an excellent question. Um, first of all... There are a bunch of terrible, terrible people. Te- I mean, it's, uh, it's the decades go back, they just get worse and worse, though. S- uh, there's a lot in the 80s. There was a whole, whole boatload oh, of yeah. in the 80s. Can I, can I say something? Hit me. Um, my wife uh, bought me uh, for Christmas this past year one of the 
Blu-ray she got me was uh, Weird Science. I hadn't seen it in years. Yeah. We popped that thing in and tried to watch it, and we're like, oh, no. <laughs> Yep. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and say I think Dabney Coleman <laughs> Okay. And nine to five. All right. Like, I mean, that's like, that's kind of got to be where the goalposts are. Right? I can see that. Okay. I mean, the whole movie is about how sexist he is. Yep. That's true. That is true. I'm trying to think. Um, 48 Hours has some good moments, though that is probably one of the most racist movies. Oh, yeah. That uh, that we have made. Um, Archie Bunker. I'm sorry. I watched a commercial for All in the Family yesterday, or maybe it was in a movie that I was watching. Oh, it was in Mindhunter. And so that's been something that's that's been on my mind. Obviously, that's TV and not movies. But that character was in so many movies, you know, because first of all, that was so successful. Um, did he have any? Did he uh, um, go to movies and do that? I mean, he did it in Heat of the Night. But there wasn't much sexism. That well, I mean, a Southern police officer dealing with women is always going to be sexist. Don't get me wrong. Well, but it, it almost might be easier to try to nail down characters who weren't. Right. That could be true. Right. Because, you know, uh, basically every character that um, Edward G. Robinson played. Oh, nice one. Yeah. Pretty sexist. Absolutely. You know? Um, yeah, it just seems that. I mean, I'm a crime film fanatic, so you can certainly believe that in crime films, every character is that way because was there it... is no strong characters in a crime film. Right. Wasn't <laughs> it? Um, uh, oh, my God. Uh, Cagney in, was it Little Caesar? Where he uh, was that little season where he put the grapefruit in her face? I believe, yeah, I believe yeah, so, yeah. My God, yeah, yeah. I was just calling women dames and slapping them on the ass all the I mean, time. I miss calling women dames. That was a good one. Uh, a professor of mine uh, who was in his eighties at the time uh, called women in the class dames. <laughs> <laughs> and one day I was like, Oscar, he called her a dame. He goes, "What is a term of endearment?" Mm -hmm. I'm like. All right. <laughs> you, they, you know, you guys pretended that it used to be, but I don't think women have ever been the biggest fan of that. I like movies that also turn that on their head, like a Thelma and Louise. Like everybody yeah. would have been that way against them, but they ended up coming out on the end. Or or the uh, the lady in the killing. Like uh, everybody thought this one thing about her, which that, that was true as well, but she ended up still using her feminine wiles to, uh, to win, at yeah. least until the end, and then she got murdered. Now, do you think it's more of a case of like a specific character being sexist or just that was the way women were written because the men were incredibly sexist. I mean, it's got to be a lot on that, that end. It has to be because the history of great females in cinema, first of all, good luck finding one pre 75. Like there was maybe five whose name isn't Garbo. It, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There was maybe five in the history of cinema before that. So, um, you know, we've got to uh, be closer to even really start to talk about that because it just doesn't even exist before then. So whether they're writing it or believing it or both, it wasn't there. So it didn't matter. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can find a lot of them on TV too. Like, I mean, even now, like uh, well, Mad Men. I mean, they were, but again, they're representing, you know, the time. Sure. But yeah, it seems like, and you already mentioned our Archie Bunker. Um, is it more prevalent on TV than movies? I, um... Well, that's a good question. I, you know, maybe, but again, maybe because in film you don't get a lot of, you barely get two-dimensional female characters, whereas at least with TV, you know, there's there's more time to 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 uh, be part of that and be with a, a female character. Okay, you and keep going on. for just even for men to talk about them, to be sexist, much less you know to be uh, you know as bad as it can be. Do you, do you want to hear how bad this problem is? I just did a Google search. Hey, sexist movie characters. Mm -hmm. Let's see who we can talk about. And every single result is, did you mean sexiest movie characters? Nah. Um, they did. That is a reflection out, of our Google system, right. too. James Bond. James Bond? Okay. James Bond. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hugely sexist sure, character. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I Absolutely. Mean, yeah. That may be the like worst. Stir yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that may absolutely be the worst. Now, they mentioned Rep Butler. Yeah. Gone with the Wind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He calls her a child all the time. and She was kind of a pain in the ass. He does rape her in the movie. That, uh, frankly, my my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> oh, the fun <laughs> funny. The, the weirdest thing about the movie is after the scene where he takes her upstairs and goes, this is one night you're not turning me out. Right. And... 
and he takes her upstairs and he basically rapes her, right? You cut to the next morning and she's in like the best mood in the world. And she's just happy and smiling, which you don't really see her do in the movie. Right. And then he comes in and he's like, I must apologize for my behavior last night. And her demeanor changes and she's angry and cold again. So that's basically the screenwriter telling us she likes being raped. Yeah, that, that really is. <laughs> that's, and that's, uh, that's, that's a, a little quintessential American movie. Is this a problem in other countries? Uh, let me rephrase that. Obviously, it is. Now, what I meant to say was that might be the dumbest films. thing you've ever in said. In films, I I did not add that to the end. How how bad do other countries? Oh, uh, it's do bad. That? It's bad. Just look at the way uh, women were portrayed in uh, '60s like swinger movies in uh, in Britain. You know. Now you've made me think about Blowout, and now you've made me angry. Blow up, excuse me. I was thinking the Antonioni that, film. Yeah, I was thinking about. Um, I'll never forget what's his name with Oliver Reed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, again, because back then it was just all. Like, it seems like every popular male character was. Let's see, you know, how many ladies we can sleep with, and you know, love them and leave them. Right? Ooh, how about Tango and Cash? I don't care. Let's talk about Tango and Cash. We should talk about it again because mm, we haven't talked about it yet this week. And second of all, that's a pretty sexist movie. Yeah. Yeah. For Terry Hatcher. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. so it's it's homophobic and sexist. If it, we can give it a threesome, uh, what's what be the third tier on that so they can be a trifecta of <laughs> majesty? Uh, so, so we have uh, <laughs> Cobra Two probably has some Cobra Two. Yeah, it probably has some bad. Stuff I was thinking uh, Species. Species is pretty oh, sexist. Yeah. yeah, it's like all I want to do is get laid. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Yep. Right. And that's uh, yeah. also that's a reflection of screen screenwriters are uh, for the most part nerds and don't get the ladies. Yeah. Oh, um, Ford Fairlane. It's mm-hmm. a pretty sexist character, but then again, they're playing off of the Andrew Dice Clay character, right? right? So yeah, of course. Uh, it seems like any kind of spy or action hero is pretty sexist. <laughs> yeah, they just yeah. don't have a lot of support for the women. So but. again, that again, I think that goes back to the whole machismo sure. kind of. So is that what? But again, I think that it at least has parts partly to do with there's a lot of male writers who don't understand women at all and don't have women in their life and they don't know how no. to write a woman. That's what I think. write a woman. Write a woman character. <laughs> <laughs> write about a woman or a woman. Meanwhile, you have uh... okay. Okay, so who do you think is the? Yeah, you know, we've talked about this. Never mind the the best female character. Barbed wire. Anyway. Pamela Anderson. <laughs> no. 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 Um. I think I'd go with uh, Ripley from Aliens, the second one. Okay. All right, fine. Yeah. I'm going to stick with Pamela Anderson. Remember when they used to build sets? Wait, what? Yeah, the, before this thing they called the CGI, they would literally build towns. I was actually thinking about that. Uh, we were watching um, a Hellboy. And the Golden Army. Oh, like yes. Two. Okay. And the scene at the end where they're fighting in the cogs. I mm-hmm. was like, oh, they built this. That's so nice. Yes. Be, uh, like I said, they've built towns. They built miniatures. They build everything in between. And I am fascinated by those times. I miss the nostalgia of those times because things were real. They were tangible. Yeah. Like there, there was some kind of dimension to them. Oh, so I, I wanted to ask you about yeah. some of the great set pieces in okay. cinema history. And I'd like to go back to a little movie they call Ben Hur. Yeah. How yeah, they killed so many horses in that scene. <laughs> First of all, yeah, back <laughs> before Peter was around. So many horses. Different times back then, different times. So so they would have had at least a few set pieces for that. Certainly the um the uh did they build a whole stadium thing for that? First of all, yes. hold on. Yes. At what point, after how many horses do you think they stopped carrying? A one. No, like no, I'm saying after the first, and they're like, nah. Well, because, like, even the Wrangler's got to be like, no, not Buttercup. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then by horse number 30, are they like, I lost another one. Right. Mark it off. Move it along. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, for most of those, they they did, and, I, and that's why they stopped making them anyway, like in the 60s, uh, because when you needed a set with, you know, 10,000 people in, in the stands, they did that. Yeah. You know, in the background, they would, you know, sometimes put, like, dummies or cutouts. But, you know, when they're doing the crossing of 
the Red Sea in 1954, right? They had 10,000 extras. Yep. So yeah, they would have to build that. They would have to get that many people. They'd have to get those costumes, and that's how they had to do it. It kind of amazing. It was very amazing. Yeah. Sounds like a pain in the butt. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, it took I forever think, to shoot. I think that it's worth it. I think things like that are definitely worth it. Well, think about this. Back then, you didn't have a video tap on the on on the camera, mm-hmm. right? So literally everything that you're shooting, only the cameraman, the guy with his eye on the glass, knows what they're getting. Yeah. And it's not until the next day that you find out if it worked or not. Crazy. So much of a roll of the dice. That's why it took so long. That's why it cost so much money. Right. And it's kind of amazing that they went that long making them that way. And that those movies... And let's actually talk about this. I was about to say those movies still look good, and a lot of them still look better than the stuff we do now. Like the original Ben Hur looks better than the new Ben Hur. Right. And do you think it's because they had to take so much time? They had to plan out every shot perfectly because it's like, guys, like we don't know what we're getting. We got to make sure we get this on the first pass because we can't kill another horse. So do you think it's because they had to take their time? They had to plan. And they couldn't just say, hey, we're going to set a GoPro down here and then CG the background. That I think that that's a big yeah. reason, for sure, definitely. Because there was more time given to the craft. And I think anytime right. you do anything like that, the more time it's given and the more effort and passion, because you had that passion at that point, otherwise yeah. you're going to kill somebody, you know, if, if you don't really love what you're doing at that moment. Did you hear about what they did for the opening shot of 2001? Where you have the moon, the, moon. the earth, and the sun oh, aligned, right. and then 2001 Space Odyssey comes yes. up. Okay. So, you know, back then, every time you did an optical shot, if you made that, this is before they even had computer control, right? So when they would do that, and they get the shot, and then they'd have to put um, the title over top of it. They'd do an optical title. And they lost a generation of film, right? And every time you do that, it gets grainier and grainier, kind of like taking a VHS tape and copying it. So VHS tape, I don't right. know. Well, uh, Kubrick didn't want them to have grain on the image in other countries. So for every different language that movie was released in, they completely reshot that opening shot. They didn't just take the finished effect shot and then put a new title on it. They redid the entire thing. Good Lord. That's... That's insanity. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is a whole heck of a lot of work. Yeah. I've got to see the miniature uh, from the last shot of 2001 when he's in the white room. Um, so I believe they built a regular size room for that mm-hmm. and then the miniature as well. Um, so to be able to to work with different things like that, again, you know, there's, even with the miniature, there's, there's you know, there's a tangible nature to the, yeah. to the thing. And um, it makes me sad they don't do it anymore. You remember Rear Window? I yeah. believe Hitchcock set up. But the whole thing was just uh, was just a set between mm-hmm. uh, James Stewart's Jimmy Stewart's uh, window that he's looking out, and then everything else that played out. And you can't do that now. But can no. you imagine that being CG? Oh, it would be awful. No. Well, take a look at the uh, the end at, of Ghostbusters when they're fighting Gozer, mm-hmm. right? That background is a painted background. It is a cyclorama, right? And they have twinkling lights built in that's not blue screen you know and it seems like people are like that's a lot of work it's like yeah but you can also move your camera wherever you want you don't have to worry about tracking you don't have to paint out hair and tracking markers and stuff and at one point it's easier for production to just throw up a green screen but it's a lot harder for the people that they're paying next to nothing so at what point can we just start saying hey you know what we can do this live kind of like um, the uh, the Marvel movies, all the suits are like CG now. Like the Iron Man, right? It's all motion capture. Yet, thirty years ago, RoboCop looked incredible, and still looks incredible, and looks better than bad CG armor. Yep. Why don't we go back to that? I don't know. I mean, directors like Christopher Nolan are, you know, certainly putting in effort to do that. I mean, so much of Dunkirk was. You know, just real there, stuff they built, extra people, you know, all those kind of things. 
And yeah. even like in thing like Inception, when the the big shootout at the end, and then the the avalanche and everything else, that was an awesome miniature that they set yeah. up. But it was like a three story miniature. It was like right. the coolest damn thing ever. And unfortunately, uh, ILM has gotten rid of their miniature department. That's crazy. So it's all CG now. That's awful. Which it is kind of awful because if you take a look at like old episodes of uh, uh, Star Trek: Next Generation, right? All of that stuff was done with miniatures. And by miniatures, you know, the the ship was like seven feet long. Yeah. And it was all finished on film. And that stuff in HD looks better than the CG coming out of the new show. And it's like maybe there's a reason we should use some of these old these old tricks. Mm-hmm. Not saying we shouldn't abandon CG. No, it's it, it can be very helpful. But kind of like uh, Lord of the Rings with a uh, tree beard. He's uh, an animatronic character with a CG face. Let's do that. Let's work on that. Do you have a favorite uh, set piece in cinema history? Oh, my God. Um, okay, you think about yours. I'm going to go ahead and give you mine. Yeah, go ahead. Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood, the old Derek, when it catches on oh, fire. That's oh. like almost in real time. Too. Oh, that's that's at, it for me. At, at dusk. dusk. Yep. Now, are we talking about like just set piece in general or like visual effects kind of set piece? Uh, either one. It's up to you. Dealer's um, choice. One that I really, really love is uh, the moment that they fall off of the skeletons at the very end of Jurassic Park when they're surrounded by the, the two raptors. Excellent. Good because, choice. Because, first of all, first use of CG. Really. It's been a weird episode. We've touched on some touchy <laughs> some stuff. Some weird stuff, yeah. We've been down a rabbit hole today. Yeah. Not our fault. We blame the world, but we have to respond to the world when it brings it to us. Right. So what are you going to do? Um, not work with Harvey Weinstein. The Good call. Yeah. I think that that's a good call, but I don't think you're going to have the option to do that either. No. So it's okay. It's okay. Do you think his brother's going to come out of this unscathed? No. Did you yeah. hear that? Oh, uh, no, no, no. What? What? Oh, I mean, he had this whole long, crazy rant thing about it. No, I haven't heard. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about that after the show, guys. You oh. definitely should go check that out. Um, In the meanwhile, though, we still love movies. It's still been a good mm-hmm. week for movies. We saw a big fancy movie on the big screen, and I've watched a big fancy movie on the small screen. And can we say that um, this 2017 has kind of been a, a rejuvenation for horror? Absolutely. Get Out. Sure. One of the biggest movies of the year. It, one of the biggest movies of the year. Uh, and now uh, Death Day. Happy yes. Death Day. Apparently, people love it, and it's doing well. $35 million opening weekend. Uh, knocked old uh, Blade Runner off the top. No, I mean, Doesn't pretty much anything me. could have done that yeah, at this point. But. Yeah, that thing opened soft. Yeah. It was it was flaccid. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've heard those times before. Sorry. No, but, um, <laughs> do we want to tell the people anything before we go, before we leave, before uh, we exit out of this space? What, what should they watch? Um. Uh. Yeah, obviously, I said Mine Hunters, but um, I can give you something else. Episodes. I just finished up that show on Showtime. Matt LeBlanc. <laughs> um. There's a show created for him, and it's him and the writers that created the show, and it was actually fascinating. It was awesome. Highly recommend it on the Showtime. Five seasons, and it's good stuff. I'm gonna say uh, it's a New Zealand film from the 80s. I think like 1985. Called Crocodile Dundee. No, that's Australian. Uh, called The Quiet Earth. Mm. It is uh, kind of like a last man on earth kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very good, very interesting, a little trippy. So, yeah, watch that. I, I really enjoyed that. Well, there you go, guys. You got a couple of things to do, listen to, and enjoy. Until the next time. See you. Later.